Hi guys, welcome to the last episode of our ESS series where we're going to be looking at topic eight, human systems and resource use. So now we're going to apply all the knowledge that we've kind of gathered so far on resource use on systems and on how usual ecosystems work and see how we can apply that to humans and human populations. So um, human population, is, it's fair to say, has followed a rapid growth rate, especially um, recently in the past kind of 100 or 200 years. Um, and you can see this in the graphical representation below that we've really accelerated the growth rate of human populations kind of recently. Um, and this is with the addition of medicine and technology, we've really pushed uh, kind of the limits of growth uh, using those resources. Um, and our current growth, most of it comes from less economically developed countries. And the current predictions on our carrying capacity is that we will peak at around nine and then level off at around 8.5 billion of our population. And if you remember, carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that an environment can sustainably support, so over a long period of time. Um, on the right here, I've got a diagram of the Malthusian theory, which was basically a model that predicted that the real limiting factor would be resources, where we would come into a point of crisis, where we wouldn't have enough resources to go around for the population, uh, especially food. They really highlighted food as um, the key limiting factor. Um, but carrying capacity, I think we can say, is dependent on three main things. Uh, resource needs that we've already mentioned, but also medicine and technology. And medicine and technology are able to kind of increase the limits that we kind of can handle. So the next thing I want to introduce to you guys are demographic tools. So these are calculations that we can uh, work out for different populations to see how they're doing in terms of development. So they help us quantify, if you will, human populations. And these are the four that the IB want you to be able to calculate starting with crude birth rate. And again, I'll explain what each of these tell you about a population in just a moment. So crude birth rate is the number of births per thousand individuals per year. The crude death rate is basically the same thing, just relating to death. The number of deaths per thousand individuals per year. The natural increase rate is the crude birth rate minus the crude death rate divided by 10. So it's basically giving you a percentage of how much the population will grow. So you take away the amount of deaths from the number of births, right? And then the doubling time would be how long it would take for the population to double in size. And the way that we work this out is we divide 70 by the natural increase rate. So you can see, you can use some of these values to work out uh, different demographic tools. Um, so what do these demographic tools tell us? Well, let's first look at birth and fertility rates. Um, they are usually highest in less economically developed countries, and you have lower birth rates in MEDCs. Um, and some factors that can affect birth and fertility rates include the need for children. So the LEDCs typically need a lot of people to work, for example, in farms or to kind of help with the family. Um, and there's also a lot of replacement births due to the high uh, mortality rates, which we'll get to again in this little second. Um, so replacement births are to accommodate for the um, high amount of deaths as well. Um, of course, level of education and employment, maybe you guys have heard about this, um, kind of empowering women and giving them opportunity uh, to be educated and to get jobs um, reduces the number of birth rates. And we see this a lot uh, in MEDCs. Um, so the more education and employment they have available to them, uh, the less uh, babies will be born. Um, and also political factors. So countries are able to um, encourage births or discourage births. For example, with China's one-child policy or Singapore in the past has had uh, policies to increase birth rate, all according to what their goals are at that time. So these are all factors which directly and indirectly influence birth and fertility rates. So as I mentioned, governments really have the power to encourage or discourage uh, birth rates and fertility rates with policies and legislation. So this is either with pronatalist or antinatalist policies. Pronatalist promote population growth, antinatalist discourage population growth, and below is an example of an antinatalist policy by uh, Singapore. So you can see that these uh, pamphlets say, take your time to say yes, um, put some years between us, so to discourage kind of birth rates and to, to discourage marriage as well. So to um, try to reduce population growth rate. 
Um, so how about death rates? What do they tell us? So um, LADCs typically have higher death rates, but not just generally. There's also a split in the reasons for the death rates primarily between MEDCs and LADCs. So in LADCs, it's mainly because of infectious diseases like cholera. Um, so they have high death rates and low life expectancies because of them. So uh, there is poor well, access to water, um, the housing efforts and sanitation aren't at a great state right now, but with improvement, they you can of course decrease death rates and improve uh, life expectancy. But uh, these are the main factors that promote death to death rates in LEDCs. In MEDCs in comparison, they're more due to degenerative diseases like strokes and cancer or heart, heart attack. Um, but in, generally, in general, MEDCs have a low death rate because of access to high quality healthcare, um, nutrition, and sanitation. So the life expectancy in MEDCs is typically higher. So now I want to talk about something called age gender pyramids that I think are really interesting uh, to discuss and useful as well because they allow us to predict human population growth and they show you the different stages of the demographic transition model starting with stage one and ending in stage four. So they basically show you a split between male and female uh, of how many individuals are present in a population of different ages. So we've got age on the uh, y-axis. So you can see that in stage one, when we're in, ex in an expanding population, there's a high proportion of individuals at younger ages, but not many at higher ages. And you can see that the curve of kind of death is um, showing you that a lot of individuals are dying before they reach the oldest age. Um, so this shows you that there's high birth rates, but high death rates. And that's usually indicative of an LEDC, a less economically developed country. Um, as we move through the stages two and three, you can, can see that the shape changes to more of a contracting shape. And that shows you that there's less of a birth rate, but of all the individuals that are born, most of them are making it to the oldest age. So you can see that the life expectancy has vastly improved by the time you've reached the last stage of the demographic transition model. Um, so you can use the shape of an age gender pyramid to tell you the stage of, de of, a de of development of a particular country. Um, and also it's not shown on this graph, but if there's an indent or a, a, a sudden change in shape, it can be for maybe a disease or some kind of change that happened one year in that population. So now that we've talked about the different factors that affect carrying capacity of human populations, I want to describe to you why it's difficult to apply the carrying capacity concept to human populations. And we can sum this up in five main reasons. The first being that the range of resources that human populations use is much faster than any other species on Earth, and we really can't compare it uh, in that sense. Secondly, lifestyle differences between individuals of different populations uh, make it hard to extrapolate the kind of the amount of resources that one individual uses to all of all individuals on Earth. There are vast differences between individuals. Um, technology is something that has allowed us to change what resources we use um, and the amount that we use them, um, which means that it's a very dynamic. It's a very dynamic value that's constantly changing as our technology develops. Um, fourthly, humans possess human ingenuity, which allow us to substitute one resource for another when the first goes missing. Um, and this again is something that most other species uh, don't have. Um, and finally, this is just when we're talking about carrying capacity for one population, not the global one. Um, we have the ability to transport uh, resources from one location to the other, uh, which allows us again to uh, raise the carrying capacity for a certain population in, in an area. And a concept that I have to introduce to you guys as part of topic eight, I think it's so important, is ecological footprint. And I've mentioned this in previous episodes as well. And ecological footprint is basically a way around the difficulties in applying the carrying capacity concept to human populations. So the definition is the hypothetical amount of area of land and water required to assimilate all the wastes of a population um, and provide all of the resource, resources that it needs. So it's basically the amount of land that would be required for a population at their given standard of living. And I like this little illustration of an actual footprint. Um, so it takes into account two measures, the amount of land that you need to provide resources for the population and to assimilate all of its wastes. And yeah, as I said, it provides a way around the problem of calculating human carry capacity. 
and you compare the size that you get because it gives you an, a, an amount of size uh, with the actual area available to the population. And if the area that you get in the ecological footprint calculation is larger than the actual size available to the population, then it tells you that it's living, the population is living unsustainably because they are requiring more land to assimilate all their wastes and give them all their resources. Whereas if the ecological footprint is smaller than the actual size, it tells you that population is living sustainably at a rate that's not deplenishing resources and that isn't going to reduce future generations' ability to live there. So it's an also, also a useful concept because it allows direct comparisons between MEDCs and LADCs, which isn't the case with carrying capacity for the reasons that we discussed in the previous slide. And the final points I want to tell you guys about in this episode is just ways that we can increase or decrease ecological footprint in a population. And these are probably going to be familiar to you if you've watched the other episodes of the series, but ways to increase ecological footprint are, for example, greater reliance on fossil fuels. We know that they're unsustainable, they produce a lot of pollutants. Um, this is, of course, going to increase the ecological footprint. Similarly, if a population relies heavily on technology and uh, non-renewable resources in general, that is going to impact their ecological footprint negatively. Um, using high levels of imported resources because of the transportation effects um, and consuming a lot of food, especially at higher trophic levels, if you remember what we mentioned about how much energy is lost by the time you get to uh, the fifth trophic level or beyond. Um, and on the other side of things, ways to decrease ecological footprint should again sound familiar to you. So it's things like reducing, recycling, and reusing. Um, basically improving efficiency of the resources that we do use and making sure we use renewable resources as much as we can. Um, and reducing population growth uh, to reduce resource use um, and make it taking care of the pollution that we produce. Uh, these are ways that we can increase or decrease our ecological footprint, which again is a measure of how sustainably a population is living. Um, so that brings us to the end of this entire ESS series. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I hope you found it helpful and that it's given you an overview on what ESS has to offer in each topic. Um, as always, please check out our website um, if you're interested in having online tutoring with any of us. Um, and yeah, see you next time.